Hey, Jerry. Hey, Matt. How you doing? Good. I miss uh, I miss our one-on-one -on -one time, buddy. Well, I know exactly. I can leave if you guys <laughs> want to have a moment there. <laughs> no, Scott. It's always good to see you, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. John, awesome. Good morning. <laughs> Good hey morning. Scott, where in where in Michigan are you? Are you uh, are you northern Michigan? Oh, Thank near up uh, past Traverse City. Up, up just south of Traverse City, a place called Interlochen. So my yeah, oh, I know where Interlochen is. I'm I'm gonna have a summer home right here. Oh, Grand Rapids ish. Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo. Crooked Crooked Lake, actually. <clears throat> nice. Yeah. So um, yeah, my wife's originally from uh, Kalamazoo area and. Her family's all from uh, uh, Detroit and stuff, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, we got we got more South. Michiganders here. <laughs> yeah, so Michigan. I'm a I'm a Wisconsin or what? Okay, Wisconsin. How I are you? Oh, you have spotted cow. Yeah, the greatest beer spotted. in the history of the world. <laughs> no, Scott, I got to bring you some beer. The greatest. <laughs> I'm telling you, the greatest beer in the world is this beer from um, New England called Treehouse. Uh, you right. have to you have to drive to the place. It's like a pilgrimage to get it. So yeah, I will it's like maybe Lake we Wisconsin. can figure out a, a way of sending some. So um, in the uh, in the in the comments in the chat, why don't you send me your um, the common sense? Right. What are we calling that chat now? Uh, you mean the Mattermost? Yeah, the Mattermost. Uh, Just Mattermost. Agora. The Agora, thank you. The CSC Agora is what. Um, yeah. CSC Agora. I don't know if you're Office in ready. that yet, Scott, but um, send me a chat with your your address, and I'll see if I can throw a couple of cans into a uh, <laughs> into a box. You you won't be disappointed. Have you have Have you ever had M16? Yeah, that sounds familiar. It's um right or is right is it M not M16 M M55, if there's a road in Michigan that there's a beer named after. And when you I'm pour sure. it, it almost looks like, um, it almost looks like Tang. Oh, I it's thought like you were gonna say the foam shapes itself into the, the hand of Michigan. Yeah, it does. Everything in Michigan is it. Everyone's like, uh, yeah. yeah. Isn't Tang like bright orange? It is. It is a bright <laughs> orange beer. All natural. But it is, it's actually, it's like, yeah, it, yeah. Hazy you say all natural, or unnatural. All oh, natural. Yeah. <laughs> I'll find it. I like beer. I, I don't know beer. if anyone else likes beer. Oh, I, like, I beer. like beer a lot. Haven't you ever drunk a lot of beer? <laughs> Sorry, that that somehow <laughs> echoed badly. I mean, there's some people who like beer who like just to drink a lot of beer. You know, they put the Bud Lights down. You know, or the or there's but then there's the people, people who, who like travel the taste. to get the Pliny yeah. the Elder and Pliny, yeah. Pliny the what is that what's the other san francisco beer there's a whole bunch there's of san francisco beers. there's a Permanent lot of stuff old rasputin old rasputin Thelonious yeah. monk yeah for us jazz fans i gotta get my light going here excellent yeah so you're, you're uh, in the dark nice to see everybody um Good to see you too jerry thank you how are you doing okay Okay. How's your mom? A little funky. Mom, mom, my mom is in hospice care, so I don't know how long she lasts at this point. Um, and it's a, uh, it's just a weird experience to be in the middle of that process. So I, I got a lot of good advice and good conversations and some books recommended and all of that. So that's been really good. Yeah, it, um, I, it can be, it can, it can be transformative. Yeah. Um, so, in any event, um, and I hear it's your birthday today, also. And that is right. that. Yeah. No way. Exactly. Wow. I'm turning 21. Wow. Who knew? <laughs> Again. Yeah. <laughs> Where's your violin? <laughs> exactly. Not sure we should be singing here. <laughs> it feels like Groundhog Day. Happy birthday uh, to you. <laughs> Happy you. birthday to okay. you. you. Happy birthday, birthday dear Jerry. Jerry.
Happy birthday to you. Don't worry about us. Zoom calls. It's going to be like Zoom Zoom chorus. It's going to be fun today. I think we need some singing lessons. Thank you so much. We could do like the Lux Eterna choir or whatever whatever that was. The forgetting his name, the guy who did the early chorus on the Intertubes. Yeah, I, I heard a story about the Happy Birthday song that it actually is still owned and was written by someone, and they get. That's why restaurants sing their own ones because then they don't have to pay, to pay for the rights. <laughs> and the Boy Scouts and the Boy Scouts got sued because they were singing Happy Birthday or something. They're, this goes back a long ways. It's it's a, it's a terrible intellectual property story. Horrible. It's like take me out to the ball game. I was I was in the Brill Building in New York, which is a famous music entertainment place and right next door to our studio was was the little office which was still maintained by the heir of the author of take me out to the ball game anyway yeah and a it's like a little under. toll booth an intellectual toll booth <laughs> exactly <laughs> Woo! Uh, oh now we've got a musical interlude <laughs> So am I the only one who's toasting you happy birthday, Jerry, with a glass of wine? Because this is I'm living in India. You're the only one See, in the world. I love it. It. <laughs> you know, it's it's after five o'clock somewhere in the world all the time. Yeah, so it's <laughs> it's like what, 8 30 at night in you know, it's absolutely wine time. So happy birthday, Jerry. Thank you, Sunil. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm doing a little caffeine for the morning. <laughs> Almost um, everybody there I can see is. Uh, thanks for the recommendation, Ken. I, I, um, there's a couple of books I just bought on my Kindle account on recommendations. So I'll mention them real quick. Um, they're really good. Uh, one of them is Visions, Trips, and Crowded Rooms. Um, who and What You Don't uh, Who and What You See Before You Die by David Kessler. David Kessler is a, is a really great uh, person about grief mm -hmm. and dying. And then the other one is called yep. Walking Each of Us Home. Uh, by Ram Das and Mirania, what's her last name? I can't see it on the title here. Uh, Mir Mirabai Bush. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. You ever met her? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do, you know, um, and I know we're going to do our check ins, but um, I think that there is, we, we talked about SNPs early on, Jerry, and our in our conversations with each other and how the world has been snipping experiences from each other and sort of putting them into their little um, commodified little boxes, right? Um, and by, by snipping the human relationships of things from each other, we've, we've kind of lost a sense of ourself. And I think, you know, the process of death and dying and end of life and all that stuff is something that has been greatly snipped from society. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, so in the, you know, maybe to bring this into an OGME kind of conversation, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's important to, to think about the letting and, and that moment of transition, right? We have to give up, you know, and, and, be, and lose parts of ourselves to become parts of ourselves. And um, um, I just think it's a profound experience. And, I know it's tough, uh, but it's one of those things that I've gone through a couple of times with really dear people in my life, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. So, um, I wish you all the best in this in this part of your journey. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, in 1983, long ago, uh, my dad died all of a sudden after elective kidney stone surgery. Mm. And that was very sudden and unexpected. It was like, whoa, he went into the hospital, you know, quite healthy uh, because they detected kidney stones in an x-ray and didn't, didn't survive the night uh, for wow. strange reasons that we could never actually quite figure out. Um, so that was a really long time ago, but that, but that was just from one moment to the next. And that's shaped my life a whole bunch in, in lots of different ways. And it was my earliest experience of major loss. And then my mom's decline right now has been sort of this slow, bumpy downhill ride over five years of first, you know, yeah. losing a word or two here and there, and then uh, losing some logic and then all sorts of things until a little bit over two weeks ago, a stroke, which, which robbed her not only of speech, but also of the ability to swallow. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, and, and so 
there's a whole bunch there about how we see ourselves, how we hold ourselves, what make what shapes us, what makes us. Some of the things you were just saying that, and then and then also it makes you it makes makes me face my own mortality, which took me in the shower this morning to a very OGME place of you know our legacy of what we saw, what we think, what we knew, what we uh, how we expressed ourselves in in cyberspace. Now it used to be that they'd like gather up your letters and. And lucky them, they'd have a couple of cases or a couple of rooms full of documents and they kind of had your world. But now, you know, we're endlessly replicated in cyberspace and endlessly lost in the memory hole. Um, so I was uh, busy thinking about the, the fellow that you were talking to who has early onset onset Alzheimer's who wanted to memorialize his own approach about, you know, the world, et cetera. Um, yeah. Hey, Kevin, good to see you on the call. <laughs> Yeah. Jerry, do you have siblings? I'm an only kid. Ah, yeah. My my parents. That's a different to, kind of tough. My parents mm. used to joke that they figured out what caused it, so they stopped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. So I'm an only kid. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it's a uh, and and just along the lines of kind of history and experience and memory and all that. Uh, I had a pretty uh, blessed, privileged childhood. I had a pretty ha a happy childhood, wasn't abused, didn't have it, those kinds of things. The, the one thing I wish my parents had done and grandparents had done on both sides of the family is tell me the hard stories of their lives. They, they all wanted me to have a golden childhood. My, grandmother's, mm. my grandmother spoke German, so her nickname for me was Goldele or the golden one. And they just wanted me to have like a, a happy childhood. And my, my, my mother, her brother and their and, and their her parents escaped Germany in thirty nine just barely, just barely like one of the last ships out of Hamburg, uh, and I will never know the full story of what happened, etc. And it would have been really helpful for me to figure that out. And and strangely, since sorry, I'm on a little bit of a reminiscence thing. So my hobby from age oh, 11, 12 to age fourteen, fifteen was building little model airplanes of World War Two. I was, for some reason, insatiably curious about World War II. Uh, in retrospect, I think I was somehow sniffing and digging, and I had, I had a spiritual sense of some sort that there was history here that I needed to understand. I don't know, but I, yeah. I, I wasn't attracted to jets in the space age. I would, like you, you could go hobby-wise to lots of different things, but I was going back to World War II. And then there's this bitter thing where we lived with my grandparents in Berlin for about 10 months when I was 13, I think. And I would build little airplanes sitting next to my grandmother in the kitchen as she made me my breakfast and lunch to send me off to school. And I'm pretty sure I was putting little, little swastika decals on Messerschmitts right next to her, completely unaware of what it might mean or what was going on or anything like that. I mean, uh, I'm sure I did that. And so it really, um, when, it, when that dawned on me, that was kind of hard. She never said something about that that you recall. Or, you know. Nobody ever told me, hey, dude, uh, all this, not, you know, all the little swastikas are probably <clears throat> uncool, uncool around here. Nobody, nobody said, hey, stop. They, they just wanted to yeah. go to childhood. But, but I was wow. sort of obsessed about that era in history. And I read a bunch of stuff. I had G.I. Mm. Joe, back when they were big, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I, I became quite the pacifist, given that like, I had war toys like crazy. And my dad taught me how to shoot. And he used to load his own ammo and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that informed me as a pacifist a lot, just understanding the possibilities. Do you think that's related to the Voldemort idea, don't say his name, in the I sense mean. that, so in other words, well, if you just don't say his name, then he doesn't exist anymore. For, for not talking about the history? Not talking about history, yeah. And if we just box that up and, and we never speak of it. I think I, that sounds right. And, and I, I go back to a more primitive notion of trauma and uh, whether how people cope with trauma or deal with trauma. And my family just never believed in psychology, psychiatry, approaching these things, dealing with them. My mom never dealt with them. So late, late, late in life, she started getting very, very paranoid. And I'm pretty sure it was because they had to hide and uh, all kinds of other things happened that I'll never find out about. But but all those things sort of come back to haunt you. There's a, a good book called The Body Keeps the Score, mm -hmm. a book my mom probably yeah. would never have read, like right. wouldn't have believed in. 
I was thinking recently about Orpheus and Eurydice and how the role is that he can bring her back from the dead, but he can't look back at her. And mm. I thought that would kill her. And whether the actual myth is saying, don't look back at your past because it drags you down. Mm. Mm -hmm. which, which bridges over nicely into another topic that I, is really near and dear to my heart, which is how do societies cope well with tragic history? With genocides, <clears throat> with uh, depopul you know, with occupation, uh, you know, the, the two original crimes of the United States caused an enormous cultural rift here because the far right doesn't want to talk about them and the far left is sort of a, a little bit obsessed about them in, in the best of ways because we haven't dealt with them yet. So, uh, so then an, an immediate question is what, how do we process Trump once he's not, no longer president? How do we process Trump and the history of Trump and Trump's network of people in a world that's shifting further to the right? And, and I will say that this is a reason why OGM exists is to figure out um, how to have these conversations so that we don't tip into um, a total uh, authoritarian regime worldwide. I, I might, I, I, it's interesting that like in that, in that moment that you were talking, Jerry, the thing that sort of flashed through my brain was this idea that, that there is a type of grieving that's going on or is not being allowed to go on right now about a, about a certain sentimentality um, related to America, right? So the death of, uh, you know, or the loss of innocence of mm -hmm. this, these notions of our meta narratives of, uh, you know, of all men are, you know, all people are created equal, right? Um, you know, the narrative of, um, manifest destiny and the narrative of rugged individualism and these big, you know, these big things that we've, we've grown up to believe and, and the fact that we're coming to terms with both maybe the fact that these were truth only in faith, as Doug was saying, not truth in fact, um, and that maybe there's a loss of that, you know, mm. and that losing process and allowing yourself those old parts of yourself to die, I think is incredibly powerful. And, and I think a lot of people that I know in our fair state of Michigan who are really angry and were big Trump supporters feel like America is dying. And I think we have to, you know, we have to, we have to let it go, right? So that we can create the next version of it. And I think that that process is very difficult. And that's, so it's to vilify the Trump side, to call it, you know, could be could be a miss could be a miss in terms of allowing some people to grieve for 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 an idea that is past its life, right? I understand and, that the chrysalis process is very messy for the caterpillar. Yeah, it's squishy. Yeah. Um, so I don't can know. You, I, can you imagine though? I I, I, I was I, I like the idea, and I was I was just picturing a very respectful funeral. But then, then right away, I said, I, 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 you know, that'll that'll trigger that'll trigger a a, a violent reaction. Um, you mean for yeah. the country, John? Well, for the, for the, the one past? for the seat up that there right away. As soon as you do that, eh, eh, you know, so yeah. you need you need to have a kind of a, a a weirdly hybrid ceremony that is simultaneously a funeral and a baptism. Well, maybe it's mm -hmm. a wake. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a wake. Because okay. awake is not mm -hmm. really awake and a baptism together. <laughs> I mean, if well, I mean, uh, awake, awake in some ways is, uh, you know, I, I, I love, I love our linguistic uh, uh, scholars here to kind of what, opine on that where the origin of that word is. But you know, I was very young. I attended an I, you know, kind of like a traditional Irish wake, and these yeah. things were were an, an awakening of the spirit, of the soul, of 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 life and it was a celebration of what you know in some ways of a life but also of life to come of living and um you know i guess you're right it, it you know this idea of a funeral and a baptism but it's a it's a it's its own form of a resurrection of what we care to what we care to continue to to believe in but also a letting go of of the old right it's it's that dualism it's catharsis in a way yeah. right? mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> Maybe but in the work I'm doing, it's much easier right now, um, you know, on uh, the racial wealth gap and the things I'm working around. It's just, it's just much easier right now. There's a thing next week <clears throat> that's kind of interesting. It's pension funds looking at the systemic racism in their portfolios that they've never looked at before and the unintended consequences and stuff. And that's, it's really kind of a groundbreaking thing <clears throat> because pension funds responsibility has been fiduciary responsibility, you know, and now it's like, uh, what are the other impacts that they're, it's, it's different things are cracking open. That I think are, are, are pretty good. There are two seminars on de decolonization happening, I think, today from completely different entities mm -hmm. that anybody can sign up with mm -hmm. and, and go listen to. And it's, it's super interesting what's happening. This, one of the silver linings of the Trump era is that the, all the stuff that was seething under the surface has burst onto the surface and is visible now to us. Mm -hmm. And we've normalized some very difficult language and conversations which is terrible in some ways, and then also kind of liberating in other ways because we can have this conversation. And also a lot of the people who were just being mute and felt muted and therefore were cut away from so social discourse felt liberated and jumped in. And we sort of now, we're, now know who they are and where they are in a way. Um, but, but how we deal with this is crucial, like really crucial. They're, at the end of the Civil War, uh, Lincoln, before being shot, talks to Grant about the peace and he basically, he, he, he says, we can't have what happened in France. We can't have the reign of terror. We can't have beheadings, you know, post-revolution. We need to have peace. So let them, let them drop, you know, drop their weapons and go back home and don't prosecute them. Uh, and uh, in retrospect, that may have been a lousy idea. Uh, so the origin of Wake seems to have been related to watch as in night watch hmm. uh, and vigil. And Ken just posted uh, that that etymology as the, the instant you started talking, I uh, can uh, put that in the chat. So let's keep going. Great. Well, you know, to me, whether in the US we're now facing how deep slavery was, uh, the destruction of the Native Americans, uh, the incredible stuff with the farmers in the 1880s, uh, the things like the Pullman strike and uh, the in incredible stuff around factories, the factory culture and public protest. And when you look at it all, America looks like uh, a big hunk of land with a few white guys in Washington uh, trying to put the lid on uh, and keep things going. I is the country sustainable uh, if it loses its myths? Only if we don't only if we don't connect those myths to future myths, right? Legacy, I think, is the ability to connect the past to the future, not you know, names on buildings. And and so, you know, we have to replace old mythologies with new mythologies. It's like a hermit crab won't leave its shell until it has a new home, but it will outgrow it and you know basically strangle itself. Um or yeah, but the hermit the hermit crab doesn't bring the old shell along with it. It lets it go. But that's what I'm saying. You have to let go of some of those old mythologies and you have to, but you have to have new mythologies to step into, I think, right? But a piece, of, yeah, a piece okay. of what's happening is we're, we're rediscovering older mythologies that are actually quite good for community and quite good for the commons and like Native American belief systems, uh, many of them, many, many, many of them were terrific for the land, were really good about community. They, they, they'd figured things out around the world. And my, my primitive uh, theory of history is that we used to know how to live in community on the commons and we broke that. And then we, we, we tried to basically salt the earth and demonize those people and make sure nobody went back to that. And not that, not that I wanna hit rewind and go back and reinstitute that world. I'm not trying to do that, but I'm saying that We've got this wisdom on hand. We've just been ignoring the people that are holding a lot of it. And we're not, we're doing a terrible job of integrating those ways of knowing with modernity and with technology, a miserable job. Go ahead, Matt. I, yeah, again, um, you know, and uh, been reading Latour and, and those sorts of things. I mean, those ideas um, might not work at the scale of 9 billion. The question becomes in the way that they were originally conceived. Now we could say that that means we need to descale, you know, the number of people that we have in, uh, you know, over time and you know through natural attrition. Um, 
But I think the question is, is again, I want to, one about legacy. How, how deep do we reach back into our wisdom and how do we draw that so that it moves into the, into the future in a meaningful way in the context that exists today, right? And I think that's the, that's the translation work in some ways of, um, of OGM, right? OGM is a, it sits at this interesting nodal point and wants to, at least in my mind, wants to sit between old world, new world, but also between deep ancient, you know, um, uh, indigenous knowledge and the application of that knowledge into, into a different version of what modernity might look like, right? Mm -hmm. And I think even modern is wrong. Um, yeah, uh, just a brief comment and then over to Klaus. Um, so what part of treating the land around you as sacred doesn't scale? When you are in, um, and I'd love to hear, you know, Sunil, you know, your thoughts here, but there are some places in the world where we have packed human beings so close together, like in chicken coops. Um, and that's just the way that it, it, it is, this, you know, that we think we sit here in America and everyone has all this land. The reality is, is there are, you know, millions and millions of people in small places and there is no land to be sacred anymore. Um, and I think that that's part of the problem unless we completely open the globe and redistribute that 9 billion, you know, across the, you know, um, but I think that you need a, a, a different type of whole different type of structure. And maybe, maybe I shouldn't, but that's what I mean. The land is, it's hard to treat the land sacred when, when you just don't have, the space. Um, um, I think it, the space is totally a complication and we don't need to solve for this, yeah. but, but, but I, I like this, I think this is an important thread. I like it a lot. Uh, Klaus, over to you. Yeah, uh, you can also uh, say uh, that the, Hold on. Um, Klaus, then Kevin, then Doug. Yeah. I mean, we can also look at cultures that have lived on the same land for thousands of years without destroying it. I mean, you look at England today, you look at uh, Italy, Germany, you know, they're perfectly self-sustaining. Uh, they have maintained their soil, they have maintained their capacity to feed themselves. So I don't know that <clears throat> uh, density is necessarily uh, uh, telling us that, that it can't be safe <clears throat> on the contrary. Right? That's a, a sense of maturity for specific cultures. Uh, but I, what, what I wanted to move into is the time that we are experiencing right now is a rerun of the Industrial Revolution in Fast Forward. Now you have people who have businesses that they may have inherited over generations that are no longer viable because everything is changing so quickly around us in every single sector, not just agriculture, but in every single sector. I mean, you look at the disruption that Amazon is causing, for example, it's massive, you know? And there's no national dialogue that helps people uh, understand what is happening and feel that there's anything they can do about it. You know, it's just sort of happening. And the frustration that is causing uh, is, is enormous. And it, it, it was leading to World War I. And then because the aftermath of World War I was botched up, it was leading to World War II. Now, and, and that's exactly the moment in time we're in right now. This could blow up at any given moment. Thank you. Um, Kevin then Doug. Yeah, I really recommend the book Extreme Economies. It's pretty interesting. Uh, it shows how, you know, a refugee camp in Syria can really be a good place to live and do business and work with the other. And other more managed uh, refugee camps can't. And then wild parts of the Panama that are unsafe and other places that are wild that are safe. And, you know, it gets down to, it basically gets into Ostrom's uh, principles of using resources. If you look at these things, uh, as, you know, and these are, some of these are economies that are emerging from like the tsunami in Thailand, et cetera. But it's really interesting to see what emerges and how things uh, emerge that can work where you don't think that they have any resources, you know, like a Syrian refugee camp, but they, there's principles of sharing and, and, and reciprocity that work there. And then there's principles that don't work in other refugee camps. So it's like, they have, it looks like they have nothing, but it's working in other places. It looks like they have nothing and it's not working. So it's, it's really interesting uh, book. 
Thank you, Kevin. That sounds great. I've never heard of it. Um, and also, um, let's pretend we had a huge amount of money and apparently modern monetary theory says we can just print as much money as we want and it doesn't matter because we're the world's reserve currency, which is an argument I cannot understand. But let's pretend we had a whole bunch of money. Most of these problems would break with too much money because a lot of money is basically a, a honey a honey pot for, for people who understand how to suck money out of, out of institutional uh, budgets. And that doesn't actually lead to fixing any problems. So, so in, in many cases, sort of meter or constraints lead to community and the requirement. To, you either do that or you die, or, or you don't make it through, I think, in different ways. Uh, Doug, you've been patient. Go ahead. I'm struck by how when we're discussing a problem, oh, like capital or like corporations or like what democracy is, that people do not, when I say people, as most people that I interact with, don't have an instinct to go to the history to figure out where the thing came from. The result is mm -hmm. they treat things like corporations as though they are uh, uh, in time, always been there, always will be there, and they're not modifiable by human effort. And I think thinking historically gives a tremendous amount of leverage on the present towards the future. Without it, one's left of feeling that things are just the way they are and you can't do anything about it. Can I add something really quick on that? Please. We did our show camp Europe uh, at the, the Burst Van Berlage in Amsterdam, which is where capital markets were invented. And uh, it, they were invented because they needed to share risk with people they didn't know. And the spice merchants were breaking up their cargoes into like 12 different ships so that some would get through as a way of mitigating risk. And, you know, it, it, it went there to say it's not a force of nature. It, it was there to solve a problem. To, you know, markets exist to trust people you don't know. And, you know, then they, they're treated like they're tsunamis or whatever. But anyway, it was, we, we were there to make a point that this is where the idea began. Mm -hmm. Super interesting how these yes, things are. Go ahead, Sunil. So Jerry, you and I had a nice long chat yesterday about uh, this whole 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 concept of uh, external versus internal, right? So the conscious mind versus the uh, unconscious or subconscious mind, and much of what uh, I, and uh, Matt actually asked me to try and answer this question about density and how does land become sacred if you don't really have the land and when people are packed in a certain density. Uh, my view on that is that it's actually uh, something to do with culture more than anything else. It's not the, the structural problem. It's a cultural problem. So as long as uh, we are all for ourselves, a very selfish way of looking at it, that I need to keep acquiring everything, then it, it, this density becomes a huge problem. But as long as it's uh, we over me, right? If the culture itself, the whole culture of that uh, that particular region or that particular geographical or if you look at India, for example, I mean, many of us in this generation and uh, possibly going forward into the next generation have actually forgotten our roots. We, but at the same time, we are very fortunate because you know there are many things that you imbibe because you live in this environment. And whether your conscious mind accepts it or not, you kind of are in a sharing mode most of the time, right? Which is what I think... Uh, probably would be the answer to, you know, how do people manage in, in such dense, dense uh, impoverished conditions with very low uh, sanitation, hygiene, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the population is still exploding, right? I mean, it's mm. not going, it's not stopping. So I guess it has a lot to do with culture more than structure. And I think the machine oriented thinking, the, the uh, industrial thinking is all about uh, men as machines, which is why there's so much of a focus on structure and less on, on the internal biology or the internal psychology of people. So we, you and I talked a little bit about the Vedantic uh, concepts. I, I guess a lot of this question about America, Trump, and what's happening there is something that India has actually been through in the early part of our independence, where, you know, this the whole thing about rural, uneducated, et cetera, that is what the political system actually leveraged to stay in power. 
And today, I think from whatever little I know of what ha has happened in America and the whole polarization that happened, it's just that, like Jerry, you said, it's actually just bubbled up to the surface. It's not that it wasn't there. It's just bubbled up to, uh, to the surface with a guy like Trump at the helm, right? I don't know. I mean, that's, that's about it. Um, By the way, Jerry, thanks for getting me in this group. Today, I was, you know, I, I was a little nervous about, you know, being in this kind of an August uh, gathering, but thank you very much for welcoming me. And I think I, I would like to be a part of this if you guys thank, think it's, it's a Thanks good for being idea. here, Sunil. I really appreciate it. August was a couple months ago. We're now in December, so it's a wholly different group. <laughs> on the land, okay. All right. Uh, one of the things about the land is it's a very vague concept. That's why I like Latour's view of the critical zone, the skin mm -hmm. that's on the earth as the place where all life and the known universe is, and that we need to take care of it. And it's, it, it's a concrete, physical, limited, uh, beautiful structure uh, that can orient our concerns. So I, I, I did a, a short video a while ago. I think I've mentioned it on one of the previous OGM calls a long ago. I'll find it and post it here, but it, it basically says the root of the word uh, ecology and economy is the same root is oikos and oikos is the household. And so why do we think that economy and economics and ecology are so different and so much in conflict? And my amateur theory was that um, they have a different sense of the size of the household. In mm -hmm. economic, it's every household is me and my immediate nuclear family in a zero sum game to try to acquire resources so we don't die hungry and starve. Uh, and we've been told that if only if, if each of our, our little units acts in a greedy, impulsive manner and tries to maximize our own self-interest, that the system has an invisible hand that magically wave, you know, wafts over this and will we'll straighten things out and makes things work over time and that scale is good. And in ecology, we think the house is the pale, thin, fragile layer on, on the planet that houses us and that we actually need to take care of that house. And so in ecology, we're more unified toward the maintenance of, of a much larger house. And so for me, the, the scripts in our, running in our heads are the difference between which house we see and which house we're trying to defend or do something about or, or whatever else. Go ahead, Doug. Okay, <clears throat> for the two words, uh, the logos means natural law and nomos means man-made law. Hmm. And so economy is a man-made structure. And it seems to me that the idea that it was household management can be brought into the modern period where the household is the earth and the task of the nomos is to reintegrate humans back into the critical zone in a meaningful way. Oh, that, thank you. Doug, that is everything. <laughs> well, I could go absolutely, on. But no, just I just want I just want what you said right there. I just want that playing over and over. I just want that right on my wall. Yeah, it was beautiful. Thank there, you. There's so many really interesting etymological things. Like science is from the same root as scissors. It's from cutting things apart. And religion mm. is religio. Ligio is binding. So science is so, uh, so religion is the rebinding of things and science is the cutting apart of things, right? Um, so, many, so many things are, are, are kind of what they are if you, if you peek into the, the, the word origins. One of the things that's striking about economy is the nomos in early Greek was nomia, which actually meant equal distribution. So hmm. equal distribution was considered a principle and it was coming about as the herds of cattle were getting larger and encroaching on each other. And the question is, how do we divide up the land equally? Uh, that was the origin of the nomia part of economy. And do you want to do the etymology of capitalism and capital? Well, <laughs> uh, cap comes from a uh, head of cattle. It's, the, it's cap. Uh, as in all the, all the yeah, and the tops of columns and the, where the head of the government is and all that. So capital uh, in the early times was the birth of a new head of cattle, which increased the wealth of the herd, uh, so to speak. Mm. Uh, but it's also destabilizing. 
because more head of cattle means you've got to rethink the grassland that you're grazing on. And this was an issue for early humans uh, who lived basically on Argentine cattle ranches. Cattle was the core of the diet. Uh, we're not aware of that. Um, Athens had a herd of 100,000 cattle uh, just for sacrifice. And the sacrifice was a way of maintaining the tradition of on the, the hunters doing the kill and sharing the kill among everybody. And as things settled down, that tradition started to get lost, but was brought back with the idea of, of the ritual sacrifice, where the smoke goes up to the god and the, milk, the meat is distributed among the people. So if you read something like uh, uh, the Odyssey, every time Odysseus lands on a new island, they kill a hundred head of cattle and share them around. Uh, it's a good description of that culture. But to me, the idea that capital is the natural sexual outgrowth uh, from a herd of cattle uh, tells us something about what capital is. It's increase uh, through reproduction of what we have. And uh, it seems to me that thinking that through gives us some leverage on what capital is that we might change it. I mean, the peculiar thing is that uh, democracy and capitalism are two parallel systems for making decisions. Democracy, we sort of know. Capital is decisions made for the future of society by those who own the capital. Uh, it's basically those that own the calves that are being born from what we have. Doug, thank you. Um, I'm gonna throw in kind of a dark twist in the conversation that takes us back to some of the start of this conversation, which is uh, uh, one of the books that really shook me up in the last decade was called, it's called uh, uh, The American Slave Coast, uh, written by a couple. And uh, basically they say, hey, there was a slave breeding industry in the United States and uh, uh, newly born slaves were considered interest on mm -hmm. your asset, which was how many humans you owned. And the wealthiest mm -hmm. people in America, everywhere, were you measured someone's wealth by how many humans they owned. Um, and so, so, so there's this whole, so, so slaves in, in Virginia were more valuable than slaves further south because they, they, they lived longer uh, because the weather and the crops that they were doing, there's a whole bunch of things about the economics of it. So Virginia was sort of having a, a, a higher natural reproduction rates from their slave base than, uh, than uh, other states, et cetera. And the whole thing is um, chilling in how similar it is to what Doug was just offering us about how we managed cattle and what we did. Uh, and so, so the, the depths of inhumanity of the American and broader sort of slave system of that day um, are part of this reckoning and part of you know the, the, the past that we don't really want to talk about. And, and then, and you can follow this thread around in my brain, and then, and then the South adopts um, genteel cavalier culture from England, partly because a lot of the cavaliers show up and go to the South, but cavalier culture and honor duels and uh, extreme politeness, uh, uh, protection of women, all of that sounds very Southern. This is a large facade pasted over the horrors that are happening behind the curtain. So cavalier culture is a way of making this all seem very gentlemanly uh, and very like, like proper when in fact there's just horrors happening behind the curtain constantly. So. And I, anyway, you that, know, I, I think about, um, this evolution of what man believed they could own, right? You know, from, you know, these indigenous populations that saw themselves a part of, um, you know, this critical zone to when we started to separate ourselves from that critical zone where we could then own, you know, livestock, we could own land, or crops, right? Um, we could own water, we could own other people, and now we can own other people's ideas, right? This whole mm. thing around, you know, the battle going on, and I know it seems trite in the conversation here around Taylor Swift and her music, 
and how she can't even own like like that her music can be owned by somebody first and foremost or that it's it can be owned by somebody else and i think like um even even quite honestly the rules at the organization i run is if you produce a work product or an idea that ip belongs to me as the owner of the business right and i think that idea is just we can own everything. We can own people's time. And so we're still living in a kind of a in, a, in a slave culture. And we wrap it into this genteel thing of, of, you know, this is the way businesses work, right? This is the rules that govern the way we operate. So it's fair and therefore it's okay for me to own everything and everyone and every idea and every thought and every, you know. I'm reminded of that. Green. I'm reminded of Gandhi's answer to, you know, what do you think of Western civilization? And I'm going to butcher it, of course, but you know, it would be a great concept. I mean, it would be a great idea if it, if it could happen. <laughs> great idea, yeah. yes. <clears throat> and and so another good book is called Against the Grain, and in which James Scott talks mm -hmm. about how people got civilized, which meant sort of bringing them into cities. And in China, in ancient China, they used to talk about people as being either cooked or uncooked. And the cooked were the ones who had been brought inside of cities and made to grow rice. And the uncooked were the ones who were living out and living on the land and, and much, they were usually much healthier because their diets were more varied. Uh, they had freedom to move, et cetera. But, but part of the problem is encroachment on resources and our inability to figure out how to make resources increase, which is a key question in the middle of all this. And here, I wish we had sort of Kumu systems dynamics uh, experts to say, hey, when you have lots of uh, compressed humans in a small space, it's still possible to eat well and to treat the earth well because this, because this, because this. I think that, that it rapidly gets into places where we can start exploring um, how this works and how to, how to help people figure our way through this messy, we're, we're living through the very messy bottleneck between some, uh, thanks Sunil, uh, so glad you're here. Um, we're missing, we're, we're sort of living through, we, our lives uh, overlap with this messy bottleneck between uh, ways of living that kind of grew artificial abundance and a lot of strife and whatever comes next. And the thing that comes next could be awful and it could be actually pretty, pretty damn cool. So we're not doing our normal check-in, which is lovely. Actually, our, our conversation has been really uh, fruitful and generative. Uh, I'm thinking of going to check in format just to see where we are and uh, and come back in. Does that sound good? Cool. Uh, so let's go to uh, Judy J. Kevin. And you are still muted, Judy. Yep, you're looking for the mute button, I can tell. Yes, Perfect. I am. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, very rich conversation, and it's going to drive me back to my big dictionary to look up a lot of other words. But thank you, Doug, for that reminder of how our heritage is caught in our language. Um, very, very rich explanations. Um, I'm caught up in the, the drift right now of taking the large principles to the implementation of the practical in, in a sharing of the process with other groups of people. I'm not looking so much personally right now at trying to influence systems directly, which would be the logical outcome, but how to share the process of communication that we're experiencing here and the evocation of thought with circles of people because I'd love to have people taking the gratitude of Thanksgiving and the hope of the holiday season forward in a generative way in their personal, internal, and external conversations. And I've been kind of trying to visualize how I could do that, should it be part of my sometimes seasonal letter, <laughs> um, what might be that process. But anyway, that's what I've been pondering in the last few days. Thank you, Judy. And you're you're reminding me you're reminding me that the conversation we just had I don't think of as a crazy abstract distraction from our work. I think of as an important part of the synthesis of our work because I'm one of my hopes is that OGM models the new way of being in the new world. And 
in order to figure that out, we need to figure out how to deal with history and how to deal with bad actors and how to deal with the commons and how to deal with all those kinds of things in really practical, pragmatic ways. So, so your, your instinct, like how does this turn to action is really near to my heart. Um, but, but without some of the conversations we just had, I think we don't get to understand how our new way of seeing changes the concept of ownership and how, how we will still be happy at the end of the day, even though we don't own you know, a thousand head of cattle or a thousand slaves or whatever else the measures have been over time. Thank you, Jerry, because that really says better what I was trying to say. I mean, the process of thinking differently is what ultimately affects the change that we hope to see. And that's what I, I was thinking about, how to get others thinking about the concepts. And in a strange and interesting way, we are sort of speaking this world into being through the process of these conversations and then our work in the world because the words we use and how this all works uh, affect all that. Go ahead, Parmji. I just want to respond um, to Ju Judith's um, expressed um, kind of objective. Um, there's somebody called Andrew Gaines. Um, he's from Australia. And um, what have you heard of him, Charles? You're nodding. I, I met him. Uh, we spent a little time in Scotland uh, to climate change okay. and consciousness. He did a um, presentation where I was at, and, and this is kind of his mission. And so his concept is to do tabletop conversation type things. So I, I will email you. I've got him in my email box, and I'll email you. Sure. I, have, I have received his mails, and I've shared some earlier in the, in the email list uh, with this group, but but thanks for bringing him up. And he, he does kitchen table yeah. conversations. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you, Parmjeet. Uh, let's go to uh, Jay, Kevin, uh, and Julian. Hey, everybody. Um, Jerry, happy birthday. I hope this is a total blessing of a day and a week and a year. And I'm uh, grateful for you. It's, it's memorable and vastly better than it otherwise would be because of you all. So thank you. Um, so I, I, I kicked off uh, um, in deciding that it's not enough to have a, a day of Thanksgiving. I kicked off a year of Thanksgiving last week um, and I've been working on that practice. And uh, it's also included some, um, you know, thanks grieving and some thanks grooving as well. And maybe even some thanks giggling. Um, as an integrated part of it. Uh, <clears throat> and then on this week, well, last week, a friend of ours came down with stage four ovarian cancer. And then this week, um, she died, just and dropped, boom. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and this is a person who is dedicated to telling the stories of telling the story of the oak tree and the acorns. That was kind of her life's work. Um, of how the acorns, which used to be such a staple in the kind of Western, <clears throat> Western food system have been just neglected. And um, so that was like her life's work. So I've been kind of being with that. Uh, and, you know, I'm a person who generally is a kind of compulsive optimist and uh, woke up at like three in the morning and came into my office and just started crying. And I was just crying for like a half an hour kind of crying for everything. It's like, cause all sorrow is tied to all sorrow, I think. Um, and um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, and and I, I view that as a, as a valuable act because it's something that I'm, you know, with kids and with work and being the like person whose job is to be the inspiring person. Um, I don't actually have a lot of space and time to do that. Um, to do that grieving. And so I think it's it's powerful that, that, that I've gone through that and I'm <laughs> gonna continue to cultivate that practice. Um, that said, I was like, as I w went back to bed, um, I was asking myself, okay, am I gonna wake up for OGM? Um, and, <laughs> and as I, you know, and I, and I said, okay, why am I gonna wake up for OGM? If I am gonna <clears throat> wake up for it. Um, and I just kind of let it go. Um, and then I got up early and it was time. Um, 
but I, I want to just say that like on the on the one hand i'm immensely appreciative for the the diversity of philosophy and approach and and power that i think is is in in this group um and on the other hand i'm continuing to ask myself like how am i going to bring my gifts in this new phase it's a constant iteration and um i guess i'll just i'll just say like um I'm asking that question as I'm sitting here in, in this group and I'm asking, um, you know, I'm asking where are we going? Um, I've got the, uh, the philosophy part and, I'm, I, and I know that's essential, um, but we've been through many philo philosophical conversations um, and many powerful explorations and clearly there's cohesion. I'll just, you know, in my like depth of feeling and contemplation, I'll say, Okay, so we, we, we went through our, um, our retreat time and our refining time and um, I would, I, maybe it's happening somewhere else and I'm not on that call, but I would just love to hear a, a summary at some point of, of where we are and where we're headed. Um, and because I have to answer those, those questions as I align my, my own future. So thank you. Jay, thank you. Let's, um, let's just go into silence with that so we can hold that before we get distracted by something else. So that was a heart full of things, Jay, thank you. And, and we're responsible for figuring out better what are we after and how do we do it? And I totally hear that. Um, let's go back from, unless somebody wants to riff on that, which would be very valuable, uh, let's go back to the check-in. And we had uh, Kevin, Julian, and then Lauren. Uh, Ken, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to amplify something Jay said. Uh, I'm uh, I'm grateful that uh, that you brought up grief uh, a few calls ago. I mentioned something about Michael Mead saying that you know we'll begin to heal collectively when we when we uh, reinstate public grief rituals. And um, you know, Jerry, I know that you're in a grieving phase. Um, you know, with your mom passing, and and um, I just think it's important for us to. Uh, be able to share our grief. Um, and this is a great place to do it because it's a safe place to do it. Uh, I, th I think anybody would be totally welcome to say, hey, I'm in grief here and get support where that's not something that is often found uh, in a lot of circles. So um, I'm, I'm grateful that we've made this a place where it's permissible and acceptable for someone to say, you know, I got up in the middle of the night and cried. Um, you know, that's a, a powerful vulnerability. So I just want to honor that uh, in, a, in a little different way there. and encourage us all to look at, um, you know, I, this is sort of losing, losing into my check-in, but I'm looking at, there's so much grief on the part of the people who voted for Trump that he lost. And that is something that's gonna need to be dealt with. And so um, if we approach it from not their anger, but the fact that there's a meme going around now that says, you know, I sat with my grief long enough to learn that her name was sadness, right? Or I sat with my anger long enough to learn her name was grief. and we've got to recognize that underneath the anger, there's a huge amount of, of unresolved grief. And so how can we um, think a, a, a way for OGM to uh, be effective in the world is to look at how can we transform anger to get to that grief, have it be expressed and eventually move to joy. Uh, Matt, Doug, Hank. Matt, you're muted. You know, I, I have to, I have to go here um, 
soon, but I want to acknowledge Jay that I think I think that there is a growing a growing tension within our conversations about this question of you know what are we doing, um, and you know one of the things that I've learned from watching groups of people come together um, and you know contemplate uh, their futures is that it takes reaching a point of um, of tension about the conversation that you then start to move into, you know, into action, and and it, it you know it merges it emerges out of that that desire to move forward that you know that um, ideas start to turn into to real action, and I think we're at that point, you know, and to be real specific about what I see starting to happen because I don't think that there is an organization that's saying, okay, here's our strategy, here's our actions, let's hear our initiatives and all that kind of stuff, is I start to see people, you know, beginning to build things, right? Um, Pete, you know, has been spending a lot of time trying to build out a, a communication architecture. Um, I see people starting to pull together other groups to say, let's, let's do these quests. I know we attempted to start a quest and it didn't quite happen. So I, I think, you know, the question is, is we have to all answer what do we need to feel like we are making the progress that we need to stay engaged in this group and then own, own that um, and own that, that making process. And I think we're getting closer um, and I don't think we're there, but I think we're at this a little bit of an inflection point of that moment of frustration and that moment of shaping of that frustration into something positive and I just hope that we continue to build our strength together and invite more people in and, and, and focus that frustration on, the, on getting action versus you know, stepping away. Because I would feel very sad if, if you stepped away from this group. Um, um, I, I, we need you and we need your voice and we need your ideas. Um, so. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I just, you know, I, I honestly like the, the thinking in my head was, well, I wouldn't be stepping away per se. It would be more like the, just the thinking in the day was like, well, maybe do I, do I lean in to the, to this continued phase or just wait until everybody figures out what it is. And then you just call on me, you know, that's, it's more like that. So I don't feel like out of it, um, that was, and I'm just explaining how I was feeling today. Yeah, as a of course, yeah. of course, you know, and I, and I honor that. And I, I mean, I wrestle with the same thing, right? I have so many competing priorities with my time, you know, and I get questions pretty much daily from my wife and business partner about, you know, why are you spending so much time with this group? And, and I, I have maybe to, to go back to what Doug said about, um, uh, what is truth? Um, you know, part of the truth here for me is is not the facts of what we're doing. It's the faith in what can come out of this group, right? Um, and that's the only thing that's keeping me here. Um, but I think I'm fe I'm feeling the same way, and I think we all are starting to feel this way. Um, and we have to solve this problem, and I think we have to start working on the internal structural stuff, the how we, how we organize, how we work, how we invite, how we do those things, and sometimes step back from the individual outward projects that we have going on that we're desperate to have the inside working properly to help us with, right? Thanks, Matt. Um, Doug Hank. Okay, um, I find myself really puzzled about the grief question. I'm thinking about it a lot. Um, you know, we're entering a time when the amount of death around us from climate change is increasing rapidly already. And how we're gonna relate to that. If we get paralyzed by it, we're not gonna be very useful. Uh, I come back to the idea that nature is beautiful in all of its phases. And there's something about dying, uh, which is fascinating. And that our grief 
uh, approach might be cultural and a kind of meme. And we need to rethink what that is. Um, how to think differently about what death uh, can be about. I mean, one of the things, since I'm 84 and should be dead by now anyway, uh, noticing with every little uh, fallback, parts of your body become clearer than they've ever been before. And that's kind of fascinating. Um, so I'm just thinking, I think the philosophers have let us down by not giving us a view of how we deal with the end of life uh, in a philosophical way. Uh, I, I know that I can already think of people who have written pretty well about it, but uh, it just to me, it's a puzzle and it's interesting and it's critical because we're gonna be surrounded by death. Uh, certainly the amount of collapse of environmental niches in a lot of the, the global South is pretty critical. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Hank? Yeah, so um, I just kind of wanted to add a, just a reflection um, for, I guess, the purposes of just having the opportunity to articulate it. <clears throat> um, and it's really in relation to the statement about grief, because it's something that I think I've been thinking a lot about, too, as it's come up in, in several of the phone calls that we've had over the past couple Thursdays, right, is how do we move forward and how do we you know, help people kind of work through a lot of this stuff. And I think one of the things that I have found difficult um, is in order to, I think, help people work through their grief, whatever it may be, whether it be this political grief that we're seeing now or more personal, requires some acknowledgement by the person and whoever is helping them walk through it, right? That that grief is like legitimate, uh, you know? And I think that something that I've found is how do you see someone else's grief as legitimate in a world in us in an environment that is as polarized as it is right now right and i think it's more um and i don't know if that's necessarily a question that we have to answer today right because it's obviously deep and rich and right it's more of like a personal challenge right to be vulnerable enough to to try and do that especially when that grief might fly in the face of so many of your personal beliefs you know? Um, and so I think that's just my reflection and maybe just a push that if we do choose to do this, um, you know, whether it be personally or as a group, that I, I think that's something that we'll have to work very actively hard on, on doing. Uh, so that's that. Thanks, Hank. Um, let's go back to the queue. Kevin, Julian, Lauren. Oh, thanks. Um, I just want to say that, you know, I'm one of those who's happy with this group as it is. I see it in the intersection and in the hallway or somewhere, so it, you know, that's what it is, and so I'm, I'm happy with it. Uh, on check-in, I have two places that I want to highlight. I'm with a group called uh, Left Leaning in a Wombies, which is the really poor rural Mississippi County I'm from, and uh, it's both sort of uh, expats and people who are still there, and it's become kind of the only... Uh, uh, support group for the folks who are there who can't afford to signal who they are. Uh, it was 88% Trump. And it was, somebody said in that group that there was an old woman uh, in, in the Walmart, which is you know, kind of taken over and destroyed the town, God bless them, uh, <clears throat> who said, you know, uh, maybe we should just take off all our masks and, and get it over with. And so, you know, she wasn't a denier. She was expressing despair in this really deep way. And that just, uh, that made me really sad. And because, I mean, you know, it, it, she wasn't fighting it. She said, you know, uh, this, it, it was a death wish and, and people applauded like, yes, maybe that's what we do, acknowledging that reality. And then secondly, I'm working in Chicago with a, a project I put a link to uh, just acknowledging our partnership. We're going to be working in the South Shore uh, of Chicago, trying to make uh, housing more affordable in red line neighborhoods. And oddly enough, um, somebody came up with an idea it looks like it actually might work like yesterday. Uh, and it was, um, this is a, a neighborhood where there's uh, still some equity in people's houses, but there's also gentrification coming, but also some houses being dilapidated and falling down. <clears throat> and they said, well, what if the people who still have some equity in their houses and they have less because they're in a red line neighborhood, and that's what evaluations work, could pool their home equity to uh, invest in other neighbors? Um, 
and that it could be actually down payment. And, that, and we're uh, looking at that. And, you know, I, I reached out to a bunch of, you know, include, there's a group of inclusive real estate funders. I mean, and then nobody had ever heard of that idea, but they all said, actually, it could work. And so this will be neighbors investing in their next neighbors. But if, if they get other people to move into their neighborhood, it's being depopulated, then their asset is increased as an intergenerational kind of thing. And it's, it's really pretty interesting. It's, it, there's also another group that looks, we're hoping to get to come there. It's called ParityHomes.com. <clears throat> and she in Baltimore uh, has done this work. 30 people pledge that they will be homeowners that then she's raised money around and then they can transform uh, uh, these disinvested blocks of neighborhoods. Uh, and, but they're both e either, you know, neighbors investing together or neighbors investing in each other. And I, I think they're, a, well, what was amazing was this odd idea. I kind of dismissed it, you know, pooling your home equity. I never once what's that mean. And you know, but then I thought about it and I sent it out to some folks and they said, you know, None of them had ever heard of it, but it's actually really doable. You just have to uh, learn to think about investing in your neighbor. And, you know, in some of these poor neighborhoods, that's a really possible thing to do. So that was, it was kind of interesting. Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the reciprocity in, in disinvested neighborhoods in Chicago versus the despair back in, uh, you know, 88% Trump, 90% white uh, Appalachian Northeast corner of Mississippi. So that's it. Um, Kevin, thank you. I just put in the chat a guy named Kevin Kavanaugh, who's a friend of ours yeah. now here in Portland. He's he's doing a lot of really interesting work on on real estate and property and trying to figure out um, innovative. Is he models. part of the community investment trust that came out of Mercy Corps? Not as far as I know. Okay. No. Well, yeah, I'd love an intro. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'd love to know. Right. Uh, he did a really nice TEDx talk. I'll put the the link to that uh, here in a second. Uh, first, let's go to Julian, Lauren, then Pete. Well, <clears throat> Jay, thank you for that phrase. It uh, so succinctly expresses how humanity is connected. <clears throat> uh, so for uh, check-in, uh, first off, sorry I missed last week because I turned off the 7 a.m. alarm and then, but then neglected to set an 8 alarm, uh, 8 o'clock alarm and slept through it. However, I still haven't forgiven the group for interrupting my dream about playing with a puppy a few weeks ago. So I guess now we're even. <clears throat> Um, I just get, finished giving a presentation at the Neo4j developer conference about one of my areas, which is history as a graph database. And uh, it's related to OGM very quite a bit. Uh, one thing that was good about it is that it uh, sometimes you need a push to get things written down in the form, well, not written down, but uh, to get things nailed down in enough of a form that everybody else can understand what it is you're thinking about. So that's what, uh, getting this presentation ready made me do that. <clears throat> it will be up on YouTube in a few days. Uh, this one focused on history uh, because that was what one of the things I'm using this Neo4j graph database for. But I also showed off some of the visualization, which a couple of you guys have already seen bits of. And <clears throat> my quest is to be able to make knowledge something that is somewhat tangible enough that you can manage it using your human cognitive abilities and history is a test case for this so in that way it's related to what OGM is doing and uh, this uh, getting this presentation ready uh, made me describe that a little better for everybody else to consume uh, that, that I, I just finished I mean literally just finished that went until 745. So. Um, very glad you're here. Sorry about the puppy dream. And uh, your work sounds totally OGM, -y and I'm looking forward to seeing the, the video you, you produce out of it. Thanks, John. Uh, you, you will. Also, uh, you know, my visualizer also does the brain brains. And I need to get back to Bentley because I finally figured out how to visualize parts of your brain. So. Um, Cool. Uh, maybe uh, maybe we should uh, have you in the free Jerry's brain conversation, and we can sort of share those ideas. That'd be uh, really okay. Awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. That's um, so. Lauren, Pete, then Vincent. I actually just wanted to say thank you, Jerry, for kind of initiating this whole thing, and it means a lot to me. And I think uh, other people here. Um, it's almost like having a Thanksgiving every week and it's a time that I look forward to. And I think it's a, 
it's just unnecessary to think of this group as anything other than a Thanksgiving Thursday. And to me, this is the place where I can come to find people that I trust because I feel like everything, everyone that you've gathered, Jerry, and the rest of you, Matt, everyone, is like, I feel a lot of trust for you. And so this is a place where I feel like I can come and express like what I kind of am into right now. And not everyone is going to be into that, but it's the place like kind of the base camp to just go and express that and then find other people who are on the same frequency. So I just like to, you know, extend that and say the frequency that I'm on is that I need more um, in terms of like, I need a tighter network that expresses, I think, um, more mutual commitment and maybe, and that, that, that basically means like, I would like to kind of surround myself with people, maybe less people, less people, but people who feel the same fire under their asses that I do. Cause I, I feel like I have something that I have to offer that I would like to offer that I feel like I am not able to express that capacity to my hundred percent in offering other people what I can do. And I feel like I'm not able to get what I need also. So I would just like to express to other people who feel the same way that I would like to gather with you and maybe make up clearer boundaries and which is what it what is our commitment to each other and what are our accountabilities and responsibilities so i know not everyone is going to be interested in that but i would like to you know be part of a, a, a closer tighter group who's really going to promote each other and help each other to succeed in whatever our projects happen to be i don't care i don't i don't need to go all one place together but I would like to be in a place where the, the level of mutual support is, is higher. So I just wanted to express it and thank everyone again for being here and just being like an amazing pick me up to my week. Thank you, Lauren. And it's your birthday, Jerry? Yes, it is. Happy birthday. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I know, um, I'm, I'm 61 today for, mm. for the record, I know. Are you serious? Uh, yeah, yeah. You look good. Thanks, thanks. You're just it, a kid. It's, 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 it's a funny story. <laughs> so April and I got married like 13 years ago and uh, April believes in applying for stuff and often stuff shows up. So she applied for having our, our marriage published in the, the New York Times wedding section. And sure enough, we were like the cover story for the wedding section <laughs> that weekend. <laughs> and the photo they used was a photo that our our favorite photographer had taken of us, of, of, of our heads upside down, uh, and they went with that. And um, then I get a message from my friend uh, Rose, who is living in Israel, who was in the beauty parlor when she saw that article uh, in the Times, and she's leaping through. She goes to her neighbor, "Oh, that like um, I know these people, blah blah blah." And her neighbor goes, "He's had work." <laughs> <laughs> And I haven't had any work, but that made my month. It made my year. I'm like, all right, that's good. We're, we're doing all right. <laughs> um, but but like half a world away in a beauty parlor in Tel Aviv, like he's had work. <laughs> um, so anyway, back back to our regularly scheduled program, which is already in progress. Uh, Pete Vincent Parmji. Um, happy birthday, Jerry, and, and thank, thank you, you for all of this. And thanks, everybody, for all of you. Um, I, I want to honor the visions uh, uh, for OGM of, of Scott and Kevin. I, I, it, it resonates for me when they say, you know, this, this, is, this is it, guys. You know, this is really valuable. This is all we need. Um, I, I have a little bit of different vision, and I think together we kind of figure out where that goes. Um, my observation is that OGM is, is rich in philosophers and facilitators, um, and, it's, and it's a place of in interconnection. And I think 
I, I think we can scale and I think we can incubate and nurture action oriented quests. So um, I think, you know, that I think some of those quests are within OGM and many of them are going to be inspired and external to OGM and, and hopefully many of them will be aligned with OGM. So I think, I think decentralization and federation are going to be key to scaling. And then I think that communication and information exchange is the lifeblood of the decentralized coordination that we need to have. So that's what I feel like I'm working on. Um, I'm in discussion with, with many OGM folks here and, and in other places. And uh, so that's where I'm going. Thank you. And, and, and I, I don't have a mental conflict with preserving these calls as roughly how they are, but also having what we're maybe calling, what we're probably calling quests that involve tighter people on projects with deeper commitments who are doing what Lauren just described precisely. So I don't, I don't think those things are at all mutually exclusive. And I don't think we have to uh, damage this, the nature of this call uh, as it goes uh, and still have what, what we're looking for here. So I'm, I'm good with that. Um, Vincent Parmjit, then Klaus. Why is there a piece of pizza over Lauren? It's a party hat. <laughs> yeah, it does look like a tiny <laughs> slice of pepperoni. I just wrote right. that in the chat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the pepperoni party. Well, uh, wait. Uh, go ahead, Vincent. <laughs> so I'm checking in uh, with a little bit of Zoom fatigue. I, uh, I got bitten by a dog while I was walking around my neighborhood uh, last weekend. And so um, I couldn't really work out. And so I was doing a lot of zooming. And so I was doing some yoga during this call <laughs> because I just need to uh, get back into being more active. Um, and also had a dream right before this that I was walking a dog for like 30 minutes straight. <laughs> and it was like that woke me up my alarm to get into this call. So it was very interesting dealing with, uh, I guess, those, the trauma that happened from that. Um, but yeah, the last few weeks, I've been definitely more action oriented. And um, I just wanted to bring up one idea. Um, I posted in the chat this uh, gather town, which I used yesterday for the first time. And it was really, really cool. We did a like 20 person uh, networking in the Game B group networking event on Gather Town. And it's a physical board that you can walk around on. And when you get near people, their video shows up. And if you're like not vibing with the conversation, you could just walk away and leave and then go into a different conversation. And so it's like having breakout rooms, but you could actually walk around a map just like you would in like a party and like go into different conversations. Um, and so to the, the point- Hey Vincent, can, oh sorry. Can I jump in just really, really quick? There's yeah, a yeah. Musical, musical instrument museum in Phoenix, Arizona. And that's how it works. There's hundreds of displays and you wear headphones and they only interact where you are standing. Mm. So if you walk away from a display, you can no longer hear it. But as soon as you get to it, you can hear it. So that. Yeah, it's it's just 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 like that. I was, it was so cool, but I think we should definitely do it. Um, I'm proposing a quest where we um, kind of go in with our projects and then can kind of go to different, you know, all meet up in the middle and be like, hey, we're all going to go to these different sides of the map and you could bounce around and see what people are working on. But a very like action oriented uh, gathering there would be really cool. Um, and we were having a conversation in the game B space about how like, why is no one doing anything? Or like, why is, are we lacking this like action? And a common thread that came up from people just like talking about how they felt was that because there's this like culture of collaboration and like co-design, like people don't want to like do things and step on each other's toes and like, and like feel like they are uh, not, not taking into consideration others in the group. And what came out of that conversation, which I think could be insightful for OGM, is that well-intentioned people working on well-intentioned projects, uh, you know, as long as you're like learning from those quests and experiments, then it's then 
we need more people to just take initiative and do things and, and kind of experiment. And so that's what I have been focusing on recently. And um, I think, yeah, we definitely should have some more spaces and meetings that are dedicated to doing that sort of stuff together. Thanks, Vincent. I think the experiments sound great. I'll pass it to you in a second, Lauren. I just wanted to tell a brief story about one of the 4,000 odd startups that pitched me their wares back in the day. And this was in the early days of internet connectivity. So I'm guessing 94, 95. There was a company called OnLive and they had an online space where you would basically create a head avatar. Uh, you, you didn't have a body, they were floating heads in a 3D landscape, really bad polygons, like early days, uh, animation, not good, but a couple of brilliant things. Uh, the head would lip sync to you. So it was listening to your audio and the, the mouth would move along with your own audio feed into the server. And then they had invented a server, a, a kind of server technology where um, proximity mattered a lot. So as you walked around the space, people's voices got louder and, and dimmer as you, as you went around. And it worked really beautifully. It was very efficient. They had, they had optimized their, their algorithms for that particular thing. It was just genius and, and way ahead of its time and then disappeared. I have no idea where those people went or what happened to it. But, um, but I was thinking it was just a, a lovely, brilliant way to do multi-party audio. And I was hoping that their backend technology for, for multiplexing the audio would become a way that we could start doing uh, sort of virtual distributed telephony. So for example, um, if you were having a call with somebody in Florida and somebody in Berlin, the system would automatically move to a server that optimized the distance between the nodes. This is in the days when all of that mattered a whole bunch. And, and we could sort of reinvent the phone system by just moving a clever server around wherever it was needed for whoever was participating at that moment. And that, you know, your computer might become the server for, for a conversation in the building, that kind of thing. But that never materialized. Sorry for the long digression. Uh, Lauren, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, so I just wanted to say something in response to Vincent. And then what I'm going to say might sound weird to you and not what you're saying. I'm going to say the opposite from what you're saying, because you're saying we need more people to take initiatives, like we need leaders. And I'm going to say something different. What, this non-obvious thing that I've learned from years of, of research is that I actually think the problem is we, we don't have any followers. <laughs> no one's following. And so we have an entire network of people with solutions, but no one willing to be like, oh, I'll just follow you and adopt that solution. So that's, it's, it's a distinction that I think uh, leads us to a really different network-wide solution, I think. Um, uh, Julian, go ahead. <clears throat> so just a quick note, uh, we're used to doing chats on Zoom or Skype or whatever. And in the VR community, they've gone to VR interactions with people so that you don't just uh, look at Im video images on a screen, but actually 3D representations. And you're having chats with people and walking around, which you can see visually. So this is something we want to check into. I don't consider it viable right now, because in order to really utilize it, you have to have a VR rig. And that's not a non-trivial activity. So we might want to have a, a conversation about it sometime. I think that's an interesting space to play in, in in different ways. That would make a very interesting sort of quest about user experience and all of that. Um, I've I've lost my cue. Pete, you went, or were you next? You did go, yeah. Um, so Parmjit, then Klaus, and then actually uh, we're not going to make it through the whole queue today because I think we should um, we should end pretty much at our ninety minutes if we can. So. Um, uh, we had a lovely discussion earlier that sort of took some of that space. So let's go to Parmjit. And I'm going to have to shift spaces. So I'm going to, I'm still listening, but I'm going to mute myself for a second. So my sense is um, because now I've um, been coming to this group a couple of times. I've been to the Flow Show and um, I went to April's um, show as well. And I didn't even know that April was related to Jerry. So it's all very interesting. So to me, I've got to a stage where I don't think I can continue servicing like three lots of stuff every week because I've actually got um, projects. So, some of it um, has arisen from uh, the meeting with April in that um, my focus on finance seemed, seems to be com com coming together um, to an extent where there are forums that I know that um, 
you know, I, I can add value to those forums and I can like link up the thinking between them. Um, so that, I mean, I'm wrapped that we talk so much about finance today um, because it is, it is really, really key. Um, so I think the connection with here is that um, um, if, if we had um, a distilled kind of, um, you're calling them a quest around the finance side, how, how could finance work um, within the core of what we're trying to do and also within structures that are doing their own doing, but they're federated to the core. Um, so we just need like a small group of people like Lauren's saying to focus on just that, 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 that question. Um, what else did I want to say? I think that um, it would be really valuable to have like core things that we can saturate the world with. Um, so, for example, it, it was like really heartwarming for me because my dad is like 84 now and it, I saw him reading Louise Hay's book, which I read in my 30s. And I, you kind of um, just think, you know, the older you get, you kind of catch on to this kind of emotional intelligence stuff. But you don't unless somebody kind of says, hey, emotions are these, da, da, da. And he was reading it and he was going, oh, you know, do you know that your parents pass on a lot of shit to you and all of, well, he didn't use that word, but, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, he's just catching on to these concepts now. So I think there's something about these key concepts that we need to kind of just spray the world with using everything, you know, all, all the groups and individuals we've got as part of this. So I'm thinking about April's group more here because they, they seem to be the people who are out there. Well, I guess some people here are too, you know, you've got your own uh, setups, uh, NGOs or, or whatever kind of structures you've got. Um, so yeah, there are kind of like a handful of key ideas like that. And there's probably going to be a, like a handful of financial concepts that people need to really understand. Um, the fact that finance is man-made <laughs> is one of them. Um, the fact that it's got to be um, coupled to ecology is another one. And the fact that um, the kind of care economy and all of that, um, I've put a link up to do with catalyst capital. It's like, putting money into something that can catalyze change so all, all of these kind of um, things need to travel as ideas throughout kind of everything and most of the ideas are coming from people who are passionate grassroots people and so they're finding ways of um, uh, implementing them like through in a community setting and then what's happening is that people who are more die in the uh, mud uh, kind of um, institutional people are ignoring them to start with but then as people are, are continuing and persisting and developing and other people are going hey you know I'll join you then these institutional people are going well may maybe you know you've got something going there so what's happening is that people, it's like a magnet thing. And so these ideas are getting filtered through. So it's like, I think we have a, a role to play as being like a, a core, like a Taurus that's kind of spreading things out and coming back in and generating all of that it feels that. like you're it feels like you're channeling some of what lauren and charles are doing and and, and having and, and a bunch of other things we've been talking about here so um i like it so i don't know how much sense that made but i'll stop yeah. it there that's good thank you uh judy has a comment then klaus has the last check and then we'll wrap today's call i just think that what we've done today is really powerful and i think each of us can become an inoculator in the populations with whom we interact 
And that's what I was trying to express earlier, but you said it much better. Thank you. Uh, one of my amateur beliefs about social change is that one of the most powerful drivers of social change is a person who takes another person that they know by the hand to try something new. Just the trusted relationship. Um, uh, and, and we trust mostly people who are mostly like us. Uh, so just trying some, some new thing that you wouldn't normally have tried that changes how you see the world and how you are in the world is super powerful. So I think that's a form of inoculation entirely. Uh, Klaus, uh, go ahead. Yeah, the, what, what has come to mind in, in following uh, our conversations here is, is a concept I would, I'd, for lack of, of better wording, I would call a densification of narrative similar to inoculation, right? So when you think about the conversation we had early on about the history of the United States, the you know, slave trade, and, and so the, the enormous tensions that uh, have shaped and formed this culture, the more we understand about it, you know, it densifies the narrative. So it, until it really simplifies this narrative, because then uh, once these concepts are understood, they become very simple. And that, that's what I'm working on in the food business. Uh, and there is uh, actually right now, there are two international conventions running simultaneously talking about uh, what are we going to do with the food business basically. And the, the understanding that, uh, uh, that, that is shaping a narrative um, is so powerful that it becomes really simple now. And so once we have this simplicity in knowing, then we can act. So, so that's, that's what, I, what I see as um, a contribution for which you, and maybe that's the, the path that is most uh, fruitful for us to take. Thank you, Klaus. That's a lovely, I think, um, place for us to, to hit pause on today. I, um, and just by way of wrapping this call, I just want to say how grateful I am for all of you for being here. Uh, it's an act of faith and generosity on your parts to contribute your time and your presence, and in particular, your heart uh, to being here. And I, I am very aware and appreciative of it. Um, this is, and, and as a strange byproduct, maybe we'll do some good in the world, um, which would be great. But thank you for, for everything. For, um, everything. Um, so with that, on to, uh, on to a day and uh, see you all on the intertubes. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks for that.